welcome back. And today we're working on this big blue beast right here. This is a Bendix G15, a full-fledged vacuum tube computer from 1956. This particular one is on loan from System Source Museum up in Maryland. And if you haven't heard of System Source Museum, go check them out. It is a bucket list level museum. They have an unbelievable collection of machines from another Bendix to a Univac to an unbelievable collection of IBMs and even a Xerox Alto, which is set up for demonstration and they even even let me get hands on with it. So if you want to see a Xerox Alto up and running in person, go check out System Source Museum. And while you're there, give Bob a high five for me because he's an absolute legend. But why is Bob's second G15 all the way down here in Texas? Well, Bob sent it down here so we could work on it and get it restored and up and running. So that way we could send it back up to System Source and he could have a fully functioning Bendix G15 at the museum. So that's what we've been slowly working on. Although we haven't really done much work towards actually getting to the point of flipping this power switch because mostly we've been doing fact finding. And when you're dealing with something this old and kind of esoteric and very, very different than what modern computing has become, we have to know what we're working with before we start turning switches and throwing electrons at things. So that way we don't necessarily break or damage anything. And that's what we're going to continue today. In the previous episode, we took an in-depth look at all of the cards inside of the doors and we also took a moment to clean the inside of the doors and they are looking spick and span on the inside. However, the outside is still looking a little dirty. It's got, you know, 50 plus years of dirt and grime on it. So I really want to clean it up as well. And you guys left a ton of amazing comments in the previous episode about how best to clean this kind of unique crinkle paint. And I think you guys are absolutely right. I'm just going to get a bucket of warm soapy water and a nice soft bristle brush. And we're just going to kind of scrub and clean and scrub and clean. And hopefully it shines up really nice. That's one thing we're going to try and tackle today. Now I said we were going to continue to do some fact finding. We've figured out quite a lot about the logic. The next step is to really dig into and try to wrap our head around what I consider to be the heart of the machine, the rotating drum memory. And it's really different than any kind of memory that we've been thinking about since pretty much the 1970s. So I want to sit down with all of the printouts and really try to wrap my head around how this memory is used. And once we have a good idea of how the drum memory works and how the Bendix is utilizing it, we'll pop this little cover off on the side and try to get a look at the actual drum itself. That way we can confirm whether it's in good condition or not. And we can see whether there's any maybe uh, head crashes or worst case scenario, maybe some of the magnetic material is flaking off. But the only way to know is to get into the <laughs> Uh, thick of it, get it nice and clean, and then open it up and take a look. So let's get to work. Let's start by laying down a towel because this is going to get a little wet. And this is just a bucket of warm water and dish soap. I'll use this little paintbrush to do the hard work, uh, soaking it in the soapy water. And then I'll test it out on this small corner on the back of the machine. And I just kind of worked it back and forth so the bristles could hopefully work their way into the crinkles of the paint. And then I'll just wipe off all the soapy water with a towel that's been soaked in clean water. And uh, yeah, I think that's gonna work nicely. Uh, though I do need a larger brush to get these big panels clean. So I'm just using a large broom brush that's meant to have a hose hooked up to it. I just found this at the hardware store and the bristles weren't super aggressive. So I think it's gonna work really well. Uh, I'll also spend some time cleaning up the base of the machine. Uh, and then we'll move on to the front of the machine. I'll clean the door panels first. And then I want to get some before shots of the front switch panel. And yeah, you can see what looks like mold or water spots or something on the panel. I'm hoping that this cleans up without too much fuss. So I'll just use the paintbrush and the soapy water to really work that in. And then I'll wipe it all clean with the water soaked towel. And it took quite a bit of scrubbing, but Man, I think that turned out really well. It's not immaculate or perfect, but the difference is staggering. It looks absolutely fantastic now. Uh, next, I want to get the clock chassis out. This is the chassis located just under the front switch panel. And I want to remove it so I can get to the tubes on the backside and clean those up. 
With the four screws removed, it's super fiddly, but it does pull out just enough to rotate it around and get to the tube side of the panel. There's only 11 tubes on this panel, and seven of them are 6197 pentodes. The remaining four are 6463 dual triodes. The main system clock comes off of the drum into a preamplifier, and then out of that preamplifier and into the chassis here. It then goes to two inverting amplifiers that square off the signal. Then from there it goes into a monostable multivibrator to produce a pulse of a very specific length. This then goes into the grid of a two microsecond A-stable multivibrator, which is an interesting choice. There's some engineering going on here that's beyond my capabilities, but one output of that multivibrator goes to a pentode driver that ultimately goes to the clock clamp. And this creates a nice low impedance zero to minus 20 volt right pulse. The other output from the multivibrator heads down to this blocking oscillator, which I don't actually know what does. If you do, let me know. <laughs> I'm totally lost on this particular part. But anyways, the signal that comes out of it looks to be a pulse with a DC offset to minus 20 volts. Uh, this then splits and goes into two pentode drivers, just like the one above, to create the clock and shift pulse. The bottom part down here takes the clock input from above, the one we just looked at, and transformer couples it through a one microsecond delay line to paralleled pentode amplifiers. Interestingly, the read clock package is just a paralleled copy of these pentode amplifiers. So there are four pentodes in parallel to create a strong enough read clock pulse. And that sure looks a lot like a, we need more power Scotty situation to me. At any rate, I pulled this chassis out to clean the tubes, and before you hop in the comments to yell at me, I'm very aware that cleaning the tubes like this will wipe off the silk screen, but the actual tube name is on the glass using some kind of process that doesn't wipe away easily at all. The only real loss here is the RCA logo. But of the 11 tubes used on this chassis, there's RCA, Amprex, and GE. And who knows how many, if any, of these are original. I think it's absolutely worth it to clean off all of this disgusting gunk on the tube at the expense of the manufacturer's silkscreen, which doesn't really do anything for us anyways. So with all the tubes cleaned up, let's get them populated back in the clock chassis, and then get the chassis screwed back in place. After that, we'll move over to the Reed Pre amplifier. This one has four rows of nine tubes each for a total of 36 tubes, all of which are 5965 dual triodes. We'll clean each tube and populate them back into the same spots they came out of because they have a little potentiometer adjustment on them, so that's very important. Then I want to try and get this preamp chassis out to look at the backside of it. I'll remove the two locking screws with ground wires, then unplug the massive Canon connector. This thing has something like 70 or 80 pins on it. Ridiculous. Uh, and there are two massive connectors going into this box. Then I'll slowly walk the chassis out, twisting it around to get a look at the backside. And man, what a gorgeous collection of point-to-point -point wiring. It's a shame to have such awesome engineering hidden inside a box. Each tube on this chassis is a self-contained reed pre-amplifier. The reed head input comes into the grid of one triode, which is set up as a standard inverting amplifier. This amplified output is capacitor coupled to a simple cathode follower to give us a nice low impedance strong signal out. And this strong output from the pre-amplifier would then go into the input of a reed amplifier package up in the door, uh, which is shown right here on the right. And uh, we took a closer look at this package in the previous episode, so if you want to know more about how that works, check that episode out. Uh, but at any rate, while I have the preamp chassis out, I want to give it a nice brushing to clean any dirt or dust out of it. 
Cleaning went pretty well. From about 15 feet, it looks fantastic. Almost looks brand new. It's only when you get up closer that uh, you can see there's still some grime left over that I couldn't quite get out. I didn't want to scrub too hard. I was really worried about damaging that crinkled paint. So in the future, we may take a second swing at it with something a little more aggressive, but for now, it looks really good, and I think it's in a great state for us to move further with the build. And moving on with the build means that we have to wrap our head around one very very strange and difficult to understand piece, the rotating drum memory. This is like the lifeblood of the machine. It's like the heart of the machine. But what is rotating drum memory? Well, every computer that we think about has uh, a couple of fundamental things. It has a central processing unit or CPU, has random access memory or RAM, and it has some, some form of long-term storage, like a hard drive. Uh, well, the CPU, we kind of figured out by looking at all of the tubes. We didn't, we didn't really figure it out. We figured out how they were building the CPU with all of the uh, tube cards and the diode cards and the uh, very crazy wiring on the backside. The long-term storage is done with paper tape or magnetic tape. I don't have a magnetic tape unit, but Bob does. And if we can get this machine up and running on paper tape, we may get to work on one of those magnetic tape units as well. So that just leaves us with random access memory. And this is the 1950s. There's not really a great way to build random access memory. Things like static RAM and DRAM are still like 20 to 30 years out. So there was a couple of ways that manufacturers were tackling it. Core memory, I believe, was around at the time, but Bendix chose to go with a rotating drum. And rotating drum memory is actually kind of like using a hard drive as your random access memory. If you imagine the platter of a hard drive and you just wrap it around a cylinder, and then instead of having a head come out and swing over the top of the platter, you just take that head and you mount it stationary right next to that cylinder. And then you spin the cylinder, and as that cylinder spins by the head, it can read a stream of bits coming into it, or it can write down a stream of bits going out of it. And that's exactly how they're using memory here. Uh, we can actually see that laid out if we look at this page in the Theory of Operation Manual. Uh, so let's just ignore the uh, read and write heads that are in the center, the short line read heads, one word, two word, and four word write heads. Let's pretend those don't exist for the moment because we're still trying to wrap our heads around the basics here. Uh, and so what happens is there is a stream of data written down on this cylinder. And as that cylinder spins around, the long line read head reads it in bit by bit and sends it into a something. What does it send it into? Well, we actually have a schematic of that as well here. Uh, so if we take a look at this schematic, we can see we have a read head. This reads in a bit and it sends it through uh, the preamp chassis. That was that really wild looking chassis that we pulled out on the bottom. That thing is fascinating. Uh, it comes out of that preamp chassis and it goes into a read amplifier. Uh, that was one of the cards that we looked at in the previous episode. And then it comes out of that and it goes into the diode 3 package. This is a collection of AND gates, if I remember. And there's some really interesting stuff coming into and out of this. Uh, we can see that there is a bunch of inputs coming in from the central switch. Uh, and there's also a late bus and early bus input going into this. That's... That's fascinating. That tells us a little bit more about how the architecture of this is working. So we read a bit in from our random access memory, and then we're changing that bit on the way out, depending on early bus or late bus. If we don't need to change it, that bit just passes through without a change over to the right amplifier, and then it comes out of that into the right head and gets written down back onto the drum, which we can see right here. So it does this bit by bit, and it picks up a word and lays that word back down on the drum. And then that word rotates all the way around the drum, comes back over to the read head, and the process starts all over again. Now there's a couple interesting things to note here. The first is that if we look at this, it says space for storage of 108 29-bit words. And this leads us into the biggest question that everybody's going to have, which is how much memory does this machine have? 
Well, uh, we can actually figure that out by looking at the brochure. Yes, we did find the brochure for the Bendix G15 from the 1950s. Uh, but on this page right here, we can see it says internal memory, general storage, 2,160 words, quick access storage, 16 words. Now the random access time of these is dramatically different and we're gonna get into that in just a second. But first let's try to figure out what it means by words. We can actually figure out what the raw storage is in our kind of parlance that we understand today. Uh, and we can do that by looking at this page out of the Theory of Operation manual. Uh, it says there are 21 long lines, uh, which is 108 words. That actually uh, fits with the previous picture that we were seeing here, 108 29-bit words. Okay, uh, so there's 21 of those that have 108 words on them. There's five short lines at 116 bits, three short lines at 58 bits, and two short lines at 29 bits. But when we're talking about the total storage that a computer has, we don't include the internal CPU registers, which in this case are CN, MZ, ID, MQ, PN, AR, and CM. Uh, now I've figured out what all of those mean except for one. CN is the number track, ID is multiplicand and denominator register, MQ is multiplier quotient register, PN is product numerator register, AR is accumulator register, and CM is command register. Whew, that was a tongue twister. Uh, those are the internal CPU registers. We're not really concerned with how those work and how we can use them today, but all we are, what we are concerned with is the fact that we can't use those to count up our total memory that's available to the user. Uh, so if we do the math and uh, we figure it out, we've got uh, 20 long lines, so that's 20 times 3,112 bits and four short lines, so four times 116 bits. And that comes out to 62,704 bits. Divide that by eight and you get 7,838 bytes. So this machine has 7.8 kilobytes of random access memory available to the programmer to use. Whew. But that doesn't mean anything. The, the number we really care about is the 2,160 words. One instruction on this machine is 29 bits long. There's a lot of stuff packed into that instruction, source and destination and modifi modifiers and all of this interesting things. So our entire worldview of this machine has to be based around that size of 29 bits. Now, if we go back to this one, we say, there is space for 108 29-bit words. That means around the circumference of the drum, we can fit 108 words. So that means that we have to have multiple tracks to store the total 2,160. So when we crack open the side of the drum and we take a look inside, that's what we're expecting to see. We're expecting to see multiple heads next to each other across that uh, length of the drum that create the multiple tracks that hold all of our general access storage. Now, speaking of that general access storage, on our uh, brochure here, we saw that there was two different types of memory. There was general storage and quick access storage. Uh, general storage has a random access time of 14.5 milliseconds. This is because we have to wait for that specific word to make the entire transit around as the drum rotates to come back over to our read heads. But if we look below that, we see quick access storage has a random access time of 0.54 milliseconds. This is insanely fast compared to the general storage. Not only that, if we go back to this page here in the uh, Theory of Operation Manual, we can see that it lists all of the CPU registers, that tongue twister that we listed off earlier. They are actually stored on the rotating drum as well. So we have the CPU registers and we have this quick access storage. They all have a really fast access time and they're on the drum. How is that possible? Where are they putting it on that drum? Well, the answer lies in this little diagram right here. When the long line comes back around and is picked up by the read heads, that bit slings off into the collection of logic to have something done to it. And then that bit passes beyond the read head and hits an erase magnet. That erase magnet wipes the track. 
So this answers one question that has come up a lot in the comments, which is, is there any data still on the drum? And no, there are permanent erase magnets every time you turn the machine off, it completely wipes the drum. So if the erase magnet completely wipes out the data, we now have this fresh, unused magnetic material that is kind of in a no man's land, not doing anything. So we can actually use this no man's land as a very small, extremely small diameter rotating drum in and of itself. Uh, so you'll see that as we go past that erase magnet, we lay down our quick access storage uh, data here. And then as that track continues across, it gets read by the short line read heads. And then it reads it, throws it into essentially the same uh, collection of logic here, and then writes it back down at the bottom on the fresh, uh, freshly erased magnetic material. So you have this very short distance of write, move over to here, read it, change it, write, move over to here, read it, change it, write, repeating. Now, as that bit slings past that short line read head, hits another erase magnet to clean it up, and then we write down our long line write heads. So that was a very ingenious way of creating quick access storage. So that's how you can have CPU registers that have an access time of uh, you know, less than one millisecond, down to 0.5 of a millisecond. That's super fascinating. Uh, it was also a whole lot to take in. So I'm gonna uh, take all of this wonderful paperwork here, slide it off into the corner, and I'm gonna pull off the cover of our rotating drum because I now have somewhat of an idea of how the head should be laid out in there. Okay, the rotating drum itself is actually kind of deeper into the center of the machine here, but all of the read-write heads are located right behind this little cover right here, which actually says, help me, I'm inside the drum written on top of it. Uh, apparently every G15 has something like that written on it, or at least that's what I've heard. Uh, now I wanna get this cover off and it's held on with three screws here on the front. I've already removed the two lower. And there's a little retainer plate here that holds the two harnesses in. Uh, this harness is going to be from the right heads, uh, and this harness is going to be from the read heads. This goes into the read preamp chassis down here. Uh, so I genuinely have not taken this cover off. We are going to discover this together. So if you've got fingers to cross, cross them now. Hopefully everything in here looks good. Uh, just real gentle like. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> okay, the engineering on this is absolutely insane. We have our little diagram here and we can actually just equate the diagram like this to what we're seeing here. Right here along the bottom is all of our long line reed heads. We can see that is this harness here that's coming out and going into here. Right here at the top, these are all of our long line right heads. That's this harness that goes into this big uh, cannon connector up here. And then this one in the center is going to be a combination of reed heads and right heads for our short lines. Absolutely stunning. Stunning. Uh, now we can see the drum behind it and it looks like there's been some contact of something on there. The magnetic material is definitely not flaking off. That's good. And it doesn't look like the contact went all the way through. Like we didn't get all the way down to the raw metal underneath like I've seen with other head crashes on uh, like the Hawk drive, for example. But um, that, man, that definitely looks like a head crash to me. It looks like multiple head crashes to me. But if I reach in here and rotate it, I mean, if it's crashed, it's already crashed. I can't really make it any worse. But if I rotated it, I don't hear anything. Uh, so there is a big question. Ooh, that's a little bit of filthiness right there. That doesn't look great. Um, so we may need to uh, spend some time cleaning this thing. Um, if we can even bring it back, that's an interesting problem that we've got. That definitely looks like there's been 
multiple head crashes on this thing. Um, that might change where we go to next on this project. So after discovering that last night, I went in just to have a bit of a think. I reviewed the footage and looked at the pictures again, but I wanted to get a second opinion, so I shared them with some people that I trust. Uh, Eric, CJ, Ian, and Thomas, you guys have been awesome. And I think we're all in agreement that that drum is hosed. As I rotate it around, you can see there's some grooves that definitely go all the way down to the aluminum. There's what looks to be uh, water intrusion, water marks on it. So that's probably what happened is that uh, mildew or mold or something got in there, which uh, closed up the gap between the drum and the heads. And the last time it was spun up 30 or 40 years ago, that it crashed. So it's been crashed probably uh, for about as long as I've been alive. And well, there's nothing really we can do to fix that. Uh, so that puts us in a really interesting predicament. The drum is the heart of the machine. It's the lifeblood of the machine. And without the drum, the machine turns into a thousand pound paperweight, which I suppose if you put a piece of paper underneath this thing, it certainly isn't going anywhere. <laughs> Uh, but where do we go from here? The whole point is to get this thing up and running and without a drum, we're in a tight spot. We could, I suppose, emulate the drum, but man, you guys have been yelling at me to emulate the Hawk Drive on the Centurion for like two years now, and I still haven't done it because to me, the fantastic part of these machines, the entire reason that I'm in this room restoring these machines is to use the original hardware. The software is fun, but it's not nearly as fun unless it's on the original hardware it was built for. That's why every time I use the Centurion, I'm spinning up that Hawk Drive, even though it is a bit of a risk to use it. The goal for this would be to use the original hardware, which means that emulating the drum doesn't really appeal to me. So we gotta figure out how to get this drum back up and going. And we have two avenues to run down. I spent a ton of time talking with Eric last night. Eric, thank you so much, you absolute legend. And we actually kind of came up with a game plan for how to recoat the drum on this thing. And that is something that I definitely wanna try. But this is Bob's machine. I definitely needed to consult with Bob. And I gave Bob a call today and said, you know, laid it all out, sent him pictures, and here's where we are, here's kind of what we're thinking. And Bob said, I got a better idea. Uh, what if we just put a new drum in it? Bob has a second Bendix G15, and uh, he took the cover off of his, took a look at the drum on the inside, and it's in great shape, uh, or at least much better shape than this drum. I'm fairly certain that that drum can absolutely work. So here's the game plan. First step is going to be prioritizing getting this machine up and running as pretty much quickly as we can. And the best path forward for this one is going to be a drum swap. So we'll pull the drum out of this one, the uh, entire assembly out. I'll carry it all the way up to Maryland and I will do a drum swap. Pull the drum out of that spare Bendix G15, put this drum in that one, bring the good drum home, put it back in this machine, and then we'll go right on down with our schedule, our planned schedule of bringing this machine up. But what about this drum that's crashed? Well, Bob is on board with this idea of recoding the drum. He thinks that's fantastic and it can provide excellent uh, support for the community of G15s out there. But not just G15s. If we come up with a viable method to recoat one of these, that opens it up to a ton of other vacuum tube computers. Something like the LGP30 or maybe even an old IBM 604 or 650. These all used drum memory as well. And everybody that has one of those is gonna have the same problem. So we are absolutely going to research and run down the path of recoding this drum and getting it up and going again. But it's not going to be in this machine. It's going to be in Bob's second machine. So after we get this one up and executing code, we're going to shift gears over to that machine and get it up in executing code. All the while, we're also going to be working on Lloyd's machine. So the whole goal at the end of this is to have three working Bendix G15s. And I honestly think we can do it. Not only that, I think we can probably get 
them networked to each other. Can you imagine a network of working Bindex G15s? <laughs> How awesome would that be? So yes, we did have some slightly negative news when we saw the crash on our drum, but we have a really fantastic game plan going forward. And I am extremely excited, not just about this machine, but about the machines that are going to follow. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you stick around for future episodes on this G15 because there's a lot of exciting stuff to come. So I hope to see you next time.